Good morning, everybody. I hope you're feeling energized and inspired by a great program yesterday as I am, and that you are ready for our second day of ALC. Uh, for those of you I didn't get to meet yesterday, I'm John Chisholm, your uh, president and chair of the Alumni Association for this year, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce this morning's keynote speakers. Cindy Barnhart, uh, SM86, PhD 88, is Ford Foundation Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Chancellor of MIT. The Chancellor has responsibility for graduate and undergraduate education at MIT, student life, student services, and other areas that impact the student experience. Uh, she and Provost Marty Schmidt, to whom the faculty reports, are the Institute's two most senior academic officers. Together, they advise the president and participate in strategic planning, faculty appointments, and resource development, and institute resources and buildings. Cindy likes to say that she's responsible for all things students. Professor Barnhart is joined today by two undergraduate women who have been deeply committed to the Institute uh, and it's fo our focus on student life and learning. Together, they'll offer us a view of student life today and their goals for the future. So please welcome me, join me in welcoming Cindy Barnhart, Lorraine Wong, class of 17, and Ariella uh, Yosefat, class of 16. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you um, and with this room full of exceptional members of the MIT community. So to our alumni volunteers, thank you for serving as ambassadors to your fellow alumni and for all the work you do to keep our connections to each other and our community so strong. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to hear from our students today and, and to address one of the biggest challenges facing higher education in these times, mental health and wellness. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to tell you about the new Mind Hand Heart Initiative and the work we're doing to build a stronger, healthier community. So let me get started. I'll begin by introducing my co-panelists. They're smart, creative, and extremely committed to enhancing mental health at MIT. It's an honor to share this stage with them. So first, Lorraine Wong. Give me a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> She's a member of the class of 2017, and she's pairing women and gender studies with course six as her majors. Lorraine believes in advocating for student mental health and destigmatizing mental illness. She is also a crisis hotline volunteer at Samaritans Inc. in Boston. She has signed up to be a co-chair of the Mind Hand Heart Working Group that will focus on ways to increase help-seeking behaviors. And Ariella Yosefat, she'll graduate this academic year with a double major in brain and cognitive science and biology, nine and seven A. Uh, Ariella has been involved in active minds since her freshman year because she's had family and friends who were afraid to get help for their mental health issues. She wanted to destigmatize mental illness and create a culture at MIT where people aren't afraid to ask for help, no matter the situation. Ariella is serving as our student co-chair of Mind Hand Heart's Mental Health and Substance, Substance Abuse Working Group. So I promised you they were impressive, and they will show you this clearly in the next few minutes. So without any further de delay, I'll turn it over to them. Uh, thanks so much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chancellor Barnhart, for introducing us. 
We have a brief presentation about what it is we do on campus and why it's so important. Um, yeah, so um, I'm really excited to talk to you all and, and talk about this topic. So why do we care about mental health, especially on college campuses? Um, one in five adults experience mental illness in a given year, and one in 17 are living with a serious mental illness. So this is a really prominent issue in our society and you know, being in a college campus and being in a place where so much is happening and there are so many innovative and creative people, it can be difficult to see this issue, um, especially if you're not experiencing mental illness. But um, this problem affects all uh, communities. At MIT, 30% of students in a graduating class will have seen mental health and counseling services at least once. I'm not saying that's the problem. <laughs> the problem is not that they're seeking help. Um, it's just that this mental health issues affect uh, everyone. Um, and one of the, the scary statistics is that suicide is the second uh, leading cause of death for ages 15 to 24. Um, the suicide rate is slightly lower on college campuses because it tends to be a safer environment, but it is still an issue. Um, what, approximately 1,100 students on college campuses die by suicide every year. And so it's really um, a universal issue that we're trying to address. Um, and in a two week period, 16% of college students report feeling hopeless and 54% uh, report feeling so overwhelmed by everything they have to do. Um, and 10% report feeling so depressed that it's difficult to function. And when you have these problems, it can really be difficult to to be a functional college student. And so addressing these issues and making each student feel supported um, is a really important goal of ours. So when we talk about the MIT environment specifically, um, we have a unique situation. We're so, you know, we pride ourselves on being so challenging and that's, that can be great. I mean, some people, you know, like the people who come to MIT come because they want that challenging environment in order for them to learn and then to gain the skills that they need um, to be uh, great community members, um, so it can make you thrive. But if it's the wrong balance, and if you know you're feeling so overwhelmed by everything that you have to do, it can make you suffer, and you can spiral into into a pattern that you don't want to spiral into, and that can you know hurt you going forward. And we really, really don't want that. Um, and so one of the most important issues that we've been addressing is how to recognize the stress both in yourself and others and how to then get help and return back to being you know, a functional MIT student and, and thriving uh, within this community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lorraine, who's going to tell you a little bit about what Active Minds does. Yeah, so Ariella and I are both in Active Minds, and we've been in this club since our freshman years. Um, Active Minds at MIT is one of over 400 chapters at college campuses across the nation that work to reduce the stigma around mental illness and to increase conversation around mental health on their campuses. So here at MIT, we're just one part of a bigger picture across all college campuses. Um, and uh, our chapter is focused this year especially on increasing um, student awareness that uh, there are students here working on mental health and wellness and that we're trying to use a student voice um, to make changes or to make people feel more supported at MIT. Um, and this is our uh, events for this year and for past years and for future years. So every year we do a couple of these. Um, so depression screenings um, is something that we bring to students in the student center or somewhere that's very accessible for them. Um, and we often pair those with things that are less high stress for students, such as therapy dogs. Um, and we see that like knowing that students like um, cute things or like things that are really easy um, actually helps them to seek help. Um, so we try to make things as accessible as possible. We have a lot of um, QPR trainings, which are question, persuade, refer. Those are suicide prevention trainings for students in crisis. Um, and we have all of these. You can read them. Um, what we are focusing on right now is that um, September through October is National Suicide Prevention Month. So we've had a couple events already in the past, including a film screening of Here One Day, which is a story about a, um, a woman whose mother suffered from bipolar disorder and, um, and died by suicide. So it talks about the effects on family. Um, and that was this past week. And lastly, this is our mission. So um, 
here at MIT, Active Minds focuses very much on peer outreach, um, on making sure that students can reach out to other students, that we um, talk to other students and make them aware that um, it's okay to reach out for help, um, and to remove the stigma around all mental health issues, about talking about mental health, about talking about mental illness, um, and about talking about ju just student wellness in general. And, and mostly we do that by um, connecting students with other resources on campus, such as student support services, mental health and counseling, um, other students, we have peer ears as a group now, um, which are student, um, students trained to listen to other students. Yep, and I'm gonna turn right back to Ariella. So this, um, I'm gonna briefly discuss how to talk to a student. Um, I'm just gonna put these all up there. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, about a mental health issue, and this can apply both when you're talking to somebody specifically or just in a general context. Um, you know, how to talk about mental health in a way that's gonna be productive. Um, and so first thing is, since this is still a sensitive topic, if you're talking to somebody specifically, you wanna be discreet about it. Um, it's it's a hard topic to talk about, and if somebody comes to the table and they want to share their story, that's great, but it's still, you know, it can be sensitive. Um, most importantly, and I think these next three kind of are all in the same boat, is to be non-judgmental and, and ask open-ended questions and to just really be um, willing to, to discuss uh, a broad range of topics in the conversation and to be open um, and, to, to not be so judgmental in, the, in having that conversation like, oh, like MIT students shouldn't have a mental illness. Um, not like that. <laughs> so we just want people to be engaged in a really open and honest conversation about this. Um, and one thing that's really important for both alumni and students and, and everybody on campus is to be aware of the resources. MIT has fantastic resources um, and we're adding more um, so just to be aware of these resources, not only when somebody specifically asks you for help, but just so you can direct somebody so you know um, as a representative of your, your school uh, what it has to offer. Um, so there are some other tips on there that might apply more to talking to a specific person, but they're very um, they're useful to know and it's just, it's an important skill to, to know and you just want to make sure that you respond in a way that will increase that person's willingness to get help rather than shut them down. So I think we're, we're going to hand it back to uh, Chancellor Barnhart, but thank you all so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. thank you. So I just want to um, say a little bit about a new initiative at MIT, the Mind, Hand, Heart Initiative, um, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it, it's meant to capture uh, that this is an initiative for MIT uh, based on what MIT is, uh, the, the values and principles of MIT. Uh, so we have our own twist on uh, this particular initiative, and I'll, I'll give you a little sense of what that is. But before talking about it, I want to give you some background. Uh, in the spring, we administered to our students a Healthy Mind survey. And these are the results from the survey. Uh, what you see in the red bars are the responses from MIT. And in the gray are the responses from uh, the other schools, the averages over the other schools in the nation that took the same survey. The first thing you see is that the red bars and the gray bars kind of look alike. So what it suggests is that what we're facing here at MIT is being faced nationally. Uh, it's a challenge that uh, is being faced by head, higher education across the country. The second thing you see is the prevalence of mental health issues uh, here and across the country, and it's sobering. Um, you can see that um, major depression 
about 9% of our student respondents said they suffer from that um, in the last year. There are, um, any, pick any, any set of statistics here, and it's, it's incredibly sad and troubling, and it's a huge motivator for us here at MIT to do something. A little more data. These I picked out, um, this survey is rich with data. I picked these out because they are specific to MIT and I think they provide a, a focal point for us for some of our activities. So for example, if you look at the, the top chart, we're comparing MIT again with the national respondents. And um, the pink, red colors are who agree, strongly or agree, with the statement, at my school, students' mental and emotional well-being is a priority. And I can't actually see the numbers, but I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, it's less than 50% of our students agree or strongly agree with that. That says to us, that's an area we need to work to change. Another, I think, maybe most striking uh, result from the survey for me, well, it's hard to say most striking. Another striking is on the bottom. Now, the, the, the yellow kind of gold colors, again, they're the strongly agree or agree. And you see that about two-thirds of our students, and here there's a gap with um, the national, a big gap. Two-thirds of our students say, at my school, the academic environment has a negative impact on students' mental and emotional well-being. I think that there's so much we need to understand about that. And I also think there's so much we can do about that. So armed sort of with this data, as well as lots of knowledge about our community, we've had students, staff, faculty, working um, to learn about this problem and trying to do something about this problem. What we see is typical of MIT, we have lots of activities all over. But they, they weren't integrated or coordinated in any way, which um, is fine in some ways. But we felt we're not really leveraging all the passion an interest in doing something when these things aren't coordinated. So what we did then is we said, OK, we're going to take some immediate steps and some longer term steps. The immediate steps were mostly focused around providing our students with increased access to support services. So we have uh, increased staffing in mental health and counseling. We have increased staffing and student support services. And I think importantly for the students, this has allowed us to increase the number of hours of drop-in um, times. So we, we've opened a new office in Building 8 where students can drop in for uh, mental health consultations. And we've doubled the number of hours that uh, student support services have for drop-in hours. Another thing we heard from our students was a, a barrier to seeking help was fear of being forced to take a leave from MIT and then having to go through the readmission process. There was a lot of fear around the readmission process. So I've charged um, a committee to look at our policies around readmission and work to uh, make changes to ensure that we have the transparency that students need uh, and that they are, our policies are as fair and supportive as possible. And then the last thing um, that I want to talk about is this longer term work, which is our Mind Hand Heart Initiative. So the idea of the Mind Hand Heart Initiative is to as I said, bring all the different uh, people in our community, uh, our alumni, our students, our staff, our faculty, uh, to come together around this topic of uh, mental health and well-being on campus. 
So the mind hand heart program at its core is something called the Jed Clinton Foundation uh, Health Matters Campus Program. Okay. This program by the Jed and Clinton Foundation uh, is focused on uh, mental health and substance abuse and trying to uh, use best practices and learnings to reduce incidences of suicide on campus and uh, reduce incidences of substance abuse. We decided that, that while this would be our core and we would join the program, uh, so we joined about over 100 other schools who are part of this program, we also decided that we wanted it to be broader, that we wanted to also address sort of general well-being at MIT. So um, on the next page, I, I've listed here the working groups that are kind of the, that's where, the, that's where things happen in this Mind, Hand, Heart initiative. And the working groups have been initially selected based on research that shows that if you can work to address some of these topics, or any of these topics, you can work to push forward your agenda of uh, reducing the incidences of suicide and improving um, overall well-being at MIT. So you see here we have things like increased help seeking. We have mental health and substance abuse. I've already told you that um, Lorraine and Ariella are involved in this. Each working group has students, staff, faculty, and has a staff and a student co-chair. Uh, academic performance, I think of as being related to the data point I showed you. So if our academic environment is having such a negative impact on our students' well-being, it would be in this working group that we try to understand that and try to figure out what we can do. So I'll just give you a really quick example of something that's happened already so that you can have a sense of what might be the output of these working groups. Uh, so last semester, uh, the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department did a survey over the course of the semester of the workloads that their students were experiencing. Uh, and what they found is probably no surprise to any of you. There are periods of time of extreme workload um, and there are some classes where the workload is multiples in terms of number of hours spent of what it is supposed to be uh, for 12 unit classes. Uh, so a couple of things they did was, uh, I was at a, the EECS faculty uh, meeting last week. They presented to their faculty the results of the survey and they listed in order of decreasing number of average hours students spend on the class, class by class. And so they were shining a light on this problem and they were, they were pointing to all the faculty in the department that you need to solve it because what you do in your class has certainly an impact on students taking your class but what maybe faculty don't pay enough attention to, well certainly they don't pay enough attention to, is when you do that in your class and someone else does it in their class and someone else in their class, you've created a situation that is really difficult for our students. So, um, one, so it's the ECS, so what did they do? One thing they did was they uh, put together a software um, package where <laughs> They said, yeah, surprise, surprise. Right? It was a really cool though because what they did was, so you type in what, what subject you're teaching and then it will pop up uh, four other subjects that have the maximum overlap in uh, the composition of the class. So you've now got like five subjects where the students in your class are likely to be taking those other classes as well. And then they put all, they got the syllabi for the upcoming semester and they put all the lab assignments, problem sets, exam schedules on 
the screen. And so immediately you could see where there are these pain points of everything happening at the same time. And so the, the faculty went in and started moving things to spread it out. So that's just one example of things that can be done to um, try to improve things here. And I think there are thousands of such examples. We have seen over the last year, which has been incredibly difficult, we have seen an outpouring from our community of interest in trying to help and trying to do something. And so this Mind, Hand, Heart uh, initiative is designed for exactly that, to draw people in so we can have their um, ideas and their energy tapped um, to do something. So to do something, here's the last slide. How can you help? Um, well, one of the things we have done is we created, sort of in typical MIT style, a Mind, Hand, Heart Innovation Fund. And the idea is, there are so many ideas out there. So how about if we provide this innovation fund Anyone can write a short proposal of what their idea is with a budget and apply for funds to do this. So it might be that um, faculty want to uh, supplement what they're doing in their research on the impact of sleep on well-being by uh, creating some sensors that our students might wear <laughs> to provide data about sleep patterns for our students. It might be that a student has an idea like, tell me about your day, MIT, and wants some funding to make that happen. So that's the purpose of the innovation fund. Uh, we also have a campaign that's been launched, and I think you, you received this post postcard. We've encouraged our, our faculty and staff to post this so that students know it's OK to ask for help, and you can ask me. Um, and I'll help you um, do what Ariella and Lorraine said I should do <laughs> and uh, help direct, direct people, students, to where they can get help. Um, you can learn more about us on our website, the mindhandheart.mit.edu website. And you can also um, go to my website, chancellor.mit.edu, to find uh, the more detailed results of the Healthy Minds study. And finally, we love to hear from you. And I have here the email address. You can send your thoughts, um, your ideas to us. So with that, I will sit down and uh, start to engage in dialogue with the people you really want to hear from, uh, Lorraine and Ariella. So the way we thought we would do this is I would ask a few questions of Lorraine and Ariella. We could engage in dialogue for a bit. And then we'll open it up to, to all of you to uh, hear what you have to say. OK, so what I'll do is I'll just throw it out. And you can decide who wants to answer it, OK? All right. So I thought, how about if you begin by telling us a short story that you think best illustrates student life at MIT today? Okay. And what makes it special? What makes it unique? And what makes it difficult? I'll take this one. Um, Great. So every student's life is so different. Um, but from my personal experience, I live in East Campus. Um, and it's a really close community. All of our students um, live in a dorm their first year still. So. Um, we have we have like ten new freshmen on hall, and um, they always gather in one of our lounges. So we have we have a lounge by the kitchen, and we can cook together sometimes. But we also just sit um, in our lounge at like 11 p.m. We have hot chocolate together. People are pee setting on their 1802, 801 pee sets. They're studying. The first exams were this past week, um, and our freshmen freaked out over them. Um, but they were all studying together. Other people were playing music. Um, I was. Um, I dragged my blanket out from my room, and I was napping in the lounge. Um, and people are just happy to work together, happy to be together, um, and just 
like figure out how to be adults and how to be individuals, but by having that network of friends living with you or coming by close to you. Um, and I think that's what really makes MIT special, that we have, that we have communities that foster such connectedness um, and such really deep friendships that go way beyond like freshman year um, or sophomore year. And people, we have alumni coming back um, and visiting us on our hall at 11 p.m. Um, and it's just really fun to have, have friends that care about you so much um, right with you. Do you want to talk about what makes it difficult? Um, I think people find many different things difficult. I focus less on academics and more on life in my own life. So um, life sometimes really throws curveballs at you. This past week was really hard for me. Um, so half of the reason why I brought my blanket out to the lounge was just that I wanted to spend time with people um, and, and not focus on academics or on life or on anything else. Um, and I think, I think I was feeling that. Um, our freshmen were feeling the first exams um, back to back on Thursday and Friday. Um, and those are, those are the general institute requirements. So all of our freshmen were taking both of those classes back to back. Um, and I think, I think having work and figuring out that you have to figure out how to do all this work on your own um, is really hard. And it makes it difficult. But I think as the year goes on, people realize that they should rely on each other more. Um, and that's what makes us more collaborative. If I can comment on that, one of the things I really like about having that hall structure, and I live in a different dorm, but um, I think it applies to most, is that we don't have freshman-only dorms, and we don't have places where you go for a year and then you leave. You know, a lot of students stay in their residence halls or go to a fraternity or sorority, but in all of those places, there are upperclassmen who have been through the same things that you've been through. They've taken these general institute requirements. You know, they've had their first frightening career fair. So they can talk to you and, and say, it's going to be OK. You know, I got through this. And yes, it was difficult. And, and sometimes it, was, it felt like I wasn't going to get through it. But I did. And here are some tips. And let me support you. So I think that's really unique about MIT. Um, that we have that mixing of different class years and um, the ability to, to tell freshmen and to show them that it's going to be OK. Great. So what do you think is the biggest issue facing students at MIT in 2015? And how can we address it? So I think you addressed a lot of these, uh, or, or what we were thinking in your presentation about mind, hand, and heart. Um, and really that academic issue and its effect on mental health, I think, is especially coming from an active minds perspective, um, is something we want to address. And so I was just thinking as you were presenting um, the EECS uh, data and, and plan to coordinate schedules, how useful that would be just you know, MIT-wide exactly. and how useful initiatives like that would be MIT-wide. And I'm sure there are a thousand other amazing ideas out there, and using this initiative to um, to get those ideas out of students and to get them engaged um, is uh, I I think we should be focusing on that. And sometimes it can be hard to engage students because they're involved in so many other things. Um, so finding a way to not increase their stress but still get them to contribute to the community. Um, is one of our challenges, but it's also one of our opportunities. I agree. That that's a huge challenge, and we see it. We see it across the board. So you know, I said there was this outpouring of interest and support and uh, wanting to do something, but the reality is, students are really busy, faculty are really busy, staff are really busy, everyone is really busy, and I think that will be part of our challenge in the Mind Hand Heart Initiative is to somehow keep people engaged and, and keep the focus on this and keep moving forward with it. So, so do you think that this is the biggest issue facing students at MIT? Or are there other issues you would put up near the top or at the top of the list? I think there, you know, every student faces different issues. And we, we want to make sure that we're addressing all of them. But I certainly think, coming from an active minds perspective, that mental health is up there. And it's something that has had so much attention drawn to it um, this year that it's really important for us to start coming up with workable solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of 
different issues tie into each other and, um, and they all should be addressed. So, you know, MIT sleep patterns and, and increasing like well-being will also affect mental health and will also be affected by academic, you know, demands. So it all ties together and I think that if we work from multiple angles, that's really what's going to help solve this issue. Thank you. Okay, so what do you think the most important message is that, that you want students to know about mental health and wellness at MIT? Um, I believe that students don't always think that there's going to be someone there to catch them if they need help. Um, and I would counter them greatly or gently <laughs> or in whatever way will make them seek that help and say that there are people here who really care um, and a lot of people want you to get help. Um, and I think so long as we say that as many times as we can and in as many ways as we can, then hopefully students will understand that it's really true and people really care and they will be here to help if you need it. I'm just going to say what Lorraine said and it's so important, <laughs> you know, that, that campaign about it's okay to ask for help. Um, it's just so important to, to show in so many different ways that, that everybody is supporting you, faculty, yeah. staff, you know, fellow students, graduate students. So we, um, in, in the survey, some of the data show, um, there was a question about uh, when you needed help, why didn't you reach out for help? And it was really interesting to see uh, the responses. And the, the, the most frequent response, and it was something like close to 60%, was students said they thought they could handle it on their own. And this was, this was different from, again, the national response. We were much higher in feeling, our students feeling that they could handle it on their own. So I think that the campaign of it's okay to ask for help uh, is an important message for, for our community in particular. Um, so this is maybe a question on the minds of the audience. And that is, how do you think MIT alumni can support active minds in the Mind, Hand, Heart initiative? I mean, you gave a great list of, of ways um, they can learn more about it. They can, if you're close by, you can come to our events. We really want to reach the entire MIT community. Um, supporting the campaign, uh, supporting the initiative either by, you know, learning more about it or donating to it so that students can have the funds to do their own, or to, to do their projects within the campaign. Um, there are just so many ways, and just being actively engaged in what's going on and being aware of um, how this can really affect student lives is important. I think also um, bringing to your own communities and your, um, and your own connections within MIT's community to make sure that like, you, you also help destigmatize mental illness and mental health um, because we know it, the conversation has been changing a lot on campus recently, but um, as students, we don't really know how that conversation has been changing um, back where you all come from. Um, and to make sure that all of MIT's community knows that, um, that we want to talk about mental health now and we want to change um, the climate here about help seeking um, and students' health um, would be really great and important um, to get that message to as many people as possible. Thank you both. So I'd like to open it up to um, the audience. There are, if you just go to the microphones, on either side we'll just sort of process you from side to side. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, I find this very near and dear to my heart because I just got an email recently from the parent of a student who was forced to, uh, forced to withdraw for mental health reasons. And I think a very, very important thing that the Alumni Association can do with the permission and approval of the staff, because when I was contacted by the parent, I did contact the staff to see what I could and could not do. Um, the mother was distraught. She was a single mother. Her son was admitted to MIT. He had to withdraw. He was depressed. He was cut off. All his friends were away at college. He was home. <laughs> He was just isolated and asked what I could uh, do. Our club in northern New Jersey stepped up. 
I contacted people, I spoke with the mother. We invited the young man while he was home to participate in all of our club events. We invited the young man and his mother to come to our functions. We had an open house for admitted students. We invited the young man to come and join the panel of students to speak about the first semester at MIT. He had to withdraw after his first semester, but we included him. Uh, I connected him with alums that lived in his area who invited him to come and meet with them and help in their offices. I spoke with the mother numerous times. The young man was home for a year and a half and just returned to MIT this semester. And I, I, I really, I, I give credit to this for all of our club, but I just got an email from the mother and she said, I won't mention the name, he's doing well and is going back to MIT. Can't tell you how many, how much, uh, how many times our conversations gave me hope and kept me believing. So I think that our whole club stepped in to include this young man and his family while he was home to have that connection to MIT because he did plan to hopefully come back. So I think that, I don't know what your group can do, but if you have a student that is forced to withdraw for mental health reasons, if it's allowed you know, by the institute, if the local club in the community where he or she lives can be notified so that we can hopefully step in and provide some sort of MIT connection and inclusion in our activities so that this young man or woman will still feel that hope and connection to MIT, you know, in the belief that they will, as with this young man who's back this semester, will do. So I think that's a wonderful thing the alumni can do to support students who are dealing with this issue mm -hmm. and have to withdraw for some period. Thanks for sharing that. That's just so great. And it made me feel it was right. just when I got this email from the mother, I actually cried. I phoned it to a lot of our, our club members of health. Well, it's, it's exactly that kind of thing that Mind, Hand, Heart is all about. It's tapping into these great ideas Thank you very that much. can make well, a difference. Well, wonderful, and I appreciate everyone in our club who stepped up to help the That's family. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Paul Green. Can you hear me? I can't tell if this is on. Okay. Uh, class of 73, graduated in 74, there's a story there. Um, I think there's another thing that we as alumni and alumni can, can bring to this discussion, and I'd like to put it on the table, which is that uh, many of us had trouble at MIT. Uh, I'm tempted to ask, where the heck were you 40 years ago? <laughs> as someone who was very reluctant to ask for help, um, and, and certainly had my share of trouble. Um, what we can bring to the table is we made it through the crucible, we've had uh, great lives, great careers, wonderful children, and yet we had the same dark thoughts or flunked classes. And, and with the indulgence of my fellow alums, I'd like to ask you to raise your hands if you ever dropped a class, flunked a class, or had the professor tell you, I'm going to pass you, but you don't deserve it, okay? <laughs> So, have I made a point here that, you know, this is, you know, I don't quite know how we can be engaged. I happen to live locally. Some of us do, some of us don't. But I, I think there's a message we can bring to the current students that says it's going to be okay. Whatever problems you're having, it's going to be okay. You know, we went through that. And if and maybe if, if a few of you didn't raise your hands, Maybe your roommates went through it, or you know, a good friend went through it, and so, uh, you know, get us find find a way to get us more actively engaged is what I would say. Well, I, I have one way already to suggest. Um, so on the, it's okay to ask for help website. One of the things we're doing is um, we're videotaping people's stories, and putting them on there, so students can hear from people who have been through this before them and came out the other end successfully. Uh, so I, I, that would be a wonderful thing for you to tell your stories if you're comfortable sharing them with, with our students on the, on the website. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Uh, there's so many great ideas out there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the, 
if you'll grab the mic, I'll, I'll go to, to this side. <laughs> Thank you. And if you oh, you need to. Sorry. Hello. Thank you, Cynthia, for your candor in bringing us up to speed with what you're doing. I'm interested in any further thoughts for um, something about the life skills development. How can we help students, you know, in this critical age range, find, you know, meaning and ways to create joy? Because those, I think, are two of the big life skills. Right. Yeah, so you noticed that that was one of the working groups in our, um, in our Mind, Hand, Heart initiative. We, we agree, and not only, maybe more importantly, the Judd Clinton Foundation show, has shown that this is really important. So um, it's a working group. Anyone who wants to help us with that working group, anyone who has ideas, we are looking for help. Oh, wait. OK. Uh, hi, I'm Tim, class of 85. I was interested by that East Campus story, and I'm not a healthcare professional, but I would assume isolation can be a big multiplier for issues and problems. Yes. And I am aware of the fact that, um, for lack of a more elegant description, tragic things happen uh, less often where there's a smaller, tighter community in terms of living group, and that's not a compare and contrast, it's just a fact, you have a support group. My question is, within the framework of this initiative, is there a component of training, you know, you referenced upperclassmen, so if everybody's having hot chocolate and somebody knows this person has never showed up for that, an upperclassman knocks on their door and says, you know what, you can take a five minute break from that problem set. It's gonna get done. Come out here, have a smile, have a laugh. That's the question. No, oh, absolutely. I, I don't know if you wanna reflect on that yeah. first. I, I think that's that is a great idea. I think um, each living group tries to do that differently, um, and I think I think a lot of us do. But I, I also think that some of us get so caught up in our own lives that we forget to do that. We like see the same group of people um, in the lounge having hot chocolate or doing their work or whatever, and we sometimes forget that to go check in on people that we haven't seen that much. I mean, I think that's maybe a culture shift of something that we feel responsible for ourselves, but we also feel like we should support everyone else. So we somehow make students remember to go reach out, not just when they're in trouble or having issues, but also when they feel like their friends are. That's a large component of what Active Minds does. It's like how to help a friend. Um, so we try to make people more cognizant about the lives of others around them. I mean, I think that um, the Mind, Hand, Heart Working Group on Connectedness could potentially go look at individual communities and how which communities um, utilize tools like this and skills like this and how that's affecting um, individual students within those. Yeah, absolutely. So the connectedness working group is all about that. And uh, it's interesting because, well, one thing about our living communities are they're all different. <laughs> Uh, so that's good, and that's bad, too, in, in some ways. Um, so one of the things with connectedness, it will identify what different groups are doing, make it known. So things that work well and are effective can be shared and maybe adopted in more of the communities. I had a conversation recently with a, a student who is in a fraternity, and what he said was, you know, they have a group of, like, 30 young men at the fraternity, and he said, you, you can't go unnoticed. That's part of what they're about, is not letting you go unnoticed. Um, and so he was telling me about the different kinds of things they do to keep people connected. And so I think we have a lot we can learn from practices in our community, and I think we just, we need to do, a, um, we need to put effort into sharing those so that everyone knows about what seems to work well and what doesn't. Okay, I can take one more question. Um, yes, good morning. Um, I hear a lot of suggestions to treat symptoms and I'm, you know, while you're gathering data about courses of problems, I would make some suggestions that there's structural ways to address the problem. A lot of the stress for MIT students is generated by their very competitive nature and the mm -hmm. extremely competitive nature of the institute. Mm -hmm. And there are some structural things that allow that to be very um, exaggerated. 
For instance, people are very proud when they take enormous overloads. Mm -hmm. And they're allowed to do that. And that's often why people end up dropping courses, because they shouldn't have been taking that many courses to begin with. You know, when I was a student, there were two semesters of pass-fail, now there's only one. So I think that has added more stress, and that's in the last few years. I mean, I think there's some structural issues that, can, you know, while you're collecting data. And, you know, you just mentioned the fraternities. I lived in an independent living group, and, you know, we, it was better to be a freshman there than it is to be, to be a freshman in dorm, and you can't do that anymore because just what this student said to you, it's very hard when you have dinner in one place with 30 people, you notice the people. You can't hide for days. In a dorm, you can hide for weeks, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some structural issues that the institute can control, and it doesn't require these things to make changes at the cause rather than trying to later fix the symptoms. So I wanted you to That's comment absolutely, on that. absolutely true. And, uh, and some, of, some of the structural things are probably more obvious than others, uh, but some of the ones you've listed, as simple as, or maybe obvious as it seems like, well, why not just limit the number of units a student can take? Um, turns out there are a lot of faculty who will argue in different directions around that one. Uh, and you know academia, like the word mandate, seems to not be in our vocabulary. Um, but it, we are absolutely looking at structural issues. And um, you know, the, there is a, a strong culture here, and I'll, I'll let Lorraine and Ariella speak to it. Um, one of the things that uh, a student really eloquently wrote was about sort of this culture of, um, of suffering and glorifying it. So, you know, um, what, what the student was suggesting is, well, why don't we say things like, sleep is for the strong, not for the weak, you know? <laughs> and things that may seem pretty obvious, um, but, but go against sort of the culture. And so the, these are all really important things, I think. Yeah, I would totally agree. And I think a huge um, part of that is the student voice. If students hear from other students that, um, you know, oh, you, you know, it's, it's bad to only be taking this amount of classes, and oh, you got more than you know, seven hours of sleep last night, then that perpetuates throughout the culture. But um, if you have students like me who say, OK, I'm only taking three classes, and I'm perfectly happy with that, and I got my eight hours of sleep last night, and I'm a healthy, functional individual because of it, um, then that helps to uh, combat that other sort of culture of suffering. So, and um, we can get that from students, and I think we can also get that from alumni. If you guys you know, talk about your experiences and talk about, um, OK, you know, one semester I took five classes, but it would, you know, I dropped one, and then I took four, and then I was much happier. Or you know, this semester I got more sleep than I had ever gotten before, and that was really, really helpful. Um, you guys can also help to, to get rid of that culture of, culture of suffering. Yeah. Okay. A mind, hand, and heart invite alumni to be part of the or Ask for Help campaign today in the mezzanine lounge from 3 to 4.30 to be photoed and to share your stories. So let's thank Chancellor Bernhardt, Lorraine Wong, and Ariella Yosefah. <clears throat> We have a 30-minute break now. Refreshments or coffee will be downstairs uh, <clears throat> on the ground floor. See you at 10.30.